you right away. We're not gonna, not gonna waste any time. So who's got the first question for us? How did you get this financed? Oh, uh, well, how did I get this financed? Um, so first of all, nobody thought this was a good idea. I mean, it's a film of a two very old men who spend their time sitting in chairs thinking about word choice. Did not strike most people as a cinematic bonanza. <laughs> um, so I'm backing up. I'm gonna answer your question, but I feel like, so I had this, from the minute I had the idea, the idea came to me like a lightning bolt. And I thought, I have to make this movie. And nobody could really <laughs> see what that was except my very beloved producing partner, Joanne Nurnberg. And I had a crazed determination, and I thought it's going to work, it's going to mean something. Sorry, my credits are flashing in my eyes. Um, so, I ha happened to be at a dinner party and talking to my friend's husband, who's a brilliant cinematographer, very high-end DP, and I told him I wanted to make this movie, and he said, oh, I shoot that, and I thought, what does he mean? And I spent weeks thinking, what did he mean? I could never afford him. And I finally worked up the courage to call him. And I said, Ma, what's your rate? And he laughed. He said, oh, you could never afford me. I'll just shoot it for free. <laughs> <laughs> so that allowed us to get started. So for so I just financed it myself, but it was nothing, you know, like some Uber rides with the gear to get started. And um, we got to a point where we were able to cut a sizzle reel, a six minute thing. And that really, a wonderful, wonderful guy named Stephen Garrett is a trailer editor. He cuts Hollywood trailers, he's an old friend. And he cut this sizzle that was able to sort of magically express the film I wanted to make that I'd only shot some of and that was just in my head. And once we did that, things progressed from there. I mean, I can tell you more about the financing, but it was like, that's sort of how we were able to get it going. Who's got the next question? Caitlin? Can you pass that down to you, Thank you. Wow, this was an astonishing work of art. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, uh, what did you discover about your father that you didn't already know? Do you know, it's very funny. I get that question a lot, and I should by now have a great answer to it. Um, but here's the true answer to it. Nothing. <laughs> um, and, and, but what I mean by that is my father and I are incredibly close. And not just close in that we love each other. I mean that our, we're entwined. We have friends in common. And we are in constant communication with each other. You know, it's it, maybe not every day. But if something bad happens, I call my dad. If something funny happens, I call my You know, we're, we're just in each other's lives in a very active way. So. This was not a case of me trying to uncover some secret about my father that I didn't know. Um, it was sort of, I just, I love spending time with him, and it was a delight. The one thing that I really didn't know anything about was his relationship with Bob Carroll. Yeah. So really, everything you see in the film was a discovery for me. How are the Bobs doing now? Um, the Bobs are good. My dad is in Miami. He just went down to Miami. And he loves it there. Um, and he's going to the ballet and doing his thing. And Bob Caro just sent me an email. I got it on the way here. And I want you to know it had three semicolons. <laughs> and uh, he's working incredibly hard. Um, so I think they're good. Knock on everything. Some people down here had questions. Okay. I think somebody here. Question down here. Yeah. Thanks. Now, I, I was curious. Uh, first of all, I must say I'm envious of your childhood and, oh, right. and your relationship with the box. Oh. I've never seen anything so bizarre in my life. Oh. And being passionately in love with English and punctuation, I thought, oh, God, she is so lucky that is. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. The only complaint I have is the handheld camera. Is the what? The handheld camera. The handheld camera. Oh. It, it upset me really because I'm very old. 
I'm sorry, that's that you. Um, you know, the, the interviews were all shot, obviously, on a tripod and not handheld. The verite footage, we needed to, to shoot hand handheld in order to capture the scenes. But I did have a wonderful childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Two quick questions. The first is, um, did either of the Bobs ever use um, an actual computer? Yes, my dad uses a computer. I think you even see in the trial. Oh, yeah. oh, it's very oh, computer yeah, I'm literate. Okay, I guess. Bob Caro yeah. has a computer <laughs> and he keeps it under the desk <laughs> and he pulls it out. There's a lot of the Vietnam stuff that's coming into the LBJ library that's only available uh -huh. digitally. So he pulls out the computer and plugs it in. Often we'd be shooting in his office and we'd call and Mott would have to go back and redo his, you know, boost his <laughs> So he has it for when he needs it. Do they edit on the computer? Never. Never. <laughs> no, never. I sort of, I sort of knew that. My other question is the, the silent scene of editing at the yeah. end, you must have been in the room. What was that like? You know, in a way I'm glad that they had me that they restricted me in that way because I felt like it allows us to kind of experience their yeah, right. joy in their work in a visual right. and more visceral way than, than hearing the thing. Um, they were obviously aware that I was in the room, but what I was struck by, both when I was there and also when I see it on film, is how uncontentious it was and how immersed they are and truly joyful they are in the work that they have done for so long and that they love doing. I live across the hall from the Pharaohs. Oh, and, and he is as nice a person as you ever want to meet. He's, and he's, I had a typewriter when I, before I got my computer. And he took that typewriter because he never wanted to use a computer. Oh. I don't know if he still has that typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a very nice gentleman. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, one and then two. Uh, Lizzie, from what you know of publishing now, is anyone training editors to be editors like your father is? And not just full of marketing meetings, right? You know, um, I feel that obviously the publishing world has changed drastically. And Lynn Nesbitt says this could never happen again. And, and I, I do think she's right that it's more corporate, that it's more, you know, short term profits. All of those things have changed drastically. But I also, one of my closest friends is Jordan Padlin, who's in the film. And what I see with her and with so many young people in publishing is a passionate love of books, of reading, of, of making books better. So I think in terms of the dedication to the craft and to, the, to books, I think that's totally there. And I think my father feels very, very hopeful about books. Do you know, he's like, people are readers. And people are going to want books. They don't stop wanting books. So some people are not readers, but those of us who are, are sort of going strong. And I've seen that. I've now been traveling all over the country with this movie, and it's been so heartening to me to see roomfuls of book people. They're out there. We're not just here on the Upper West Side. <laughs> you know, which is, which is lovely. Uh, this lady here. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a copy editor and sometime editor, I love, love, love this movie. Uh, so this is sort of an editor question. Did your father ever explain why there couldn't be a cat in the first paragraph? <laughs> <laughs> he did not. He did not. <laughs> um, I just took his word for it. Lots of questions. In in terms of the means to an end, do you think your father or the author tries to guide the reader on the right? on their judgment and try to influence the book when they develop it. And yeah. Do you mean politically? For example, uh, for Robert Moses, was it worth it? Do you think they have an opinion? Oh, do you mean, sorry, I'm just, do you mean was what Moses did worth it? Was worth Correct. It? That presumably there were shortcuts and the means and the end. Yes. I, 
I certainly couldn't speak for them or to that issue. I feel like I would have to lie down on the floor. <laughs> I don't know what. But um, do you know, I had this quite extraordinary experience a few weeks ago. I, I showed the film in Austin, Texas, and Lucy Baines Johnson, daughter of LBJ, came to our screening. And I sat in the back of the auditorium, like sweating. My hands were sweating. I thought, oh my God, the stolen flesh. Oh, no, you know, what is she going to think? It was terrifying to think that, right? And we had the most extraordinary conversation afterwards. And I know that the Johnson family was very against Bob Caro initially and the, whole, the LBJ Foundation. They were all skeptical. And they slowly opened up. And Lucy Baines Johnson, she said it. I guess I can say this publicly. I don't know. She said, first she said, I am now 11 years older than my father was when he died. Mm -hmm. And I am hoping that I live long enough to understand what his legacy really is mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. And then she's got tears in her eyes and she said, hold on to every moment you have with your father. Mm -hmm. oh, so wow. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> and then she said, my mother had a saying. She would say, be careful what words you choose because words have wings. She said, I think that's what this film is about, people who choose their words very carefully. So to, to answer your question, I don't know if it was worth it or not, but I was so pleased to see that somebody who's so close to the person he's depicting there clearly feels that there's fairness and accuracy in how he depicted LBJ. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I first want to say thank you for this wonderful portrait of two unique, sensitive, amazing men. Um, and I was wondering if your father being an editor, other than that one line, insisted or desired to edit the film in any way? Um, um, really? No. This is what was amazing. Neither of these guys wanted to do this film. They both refused and refused and refused. And refused. Once they agreed, they did not ask me to see anything. They didn't ask me. I mean, they asked how it's going in general, but there was no time pressure. There was no where is it. There was no how is it. Um, and eventually, when we were getting close to being finished, I thought, oof, I have to show it to them because I don't know what I will do if there are things they don't like. You know, I thought, oh. They both signed releases, but uh, you know, and I don't want to be a filmmaker who caves and makes the film for the. But I also didn't. So um, I showed it to Bob Caro, and he said, "I love the word looms." And then he had a few things. There was one thing we had a back and there was one thing he wanted me to take out. And I resisted, and we had a big talk about it, and I came to see that actually he was right. And then we had a sort of exchange, and he said, well, if you take that out, I could say more about this. And I went out to his house in the Hamptons, and I filmed him, and it was, he was right. He was right, he's a storyteller. Um, and my father had one criticism. He said, I really think there should be an exclamation point in the title. <laughs> Exclamation point, it's an exhortation. <laughs> and I said, Dad, you know, that's interesting. I think that um, I live in a world of pe texting and social media, and I'm not, you know, we're, the exclamation point is overused. And I think it might seem a little hysterical or a little cute. And he said, Well, I really think you should listen to me. I'm the guy who put the 22 in catch. <laughs> This was incredible, but I'm wondering, did you have any sense of power yourself in having these two in hand and getting them in? That must have been an incredible feeling. <laughs> That's a great, a great question. I, I was very aware of power as I made this film, um, and I... You know, I came into this with no power, right? Begging them to do it, and there were the restrictions placed upon me. But I, I wanted to, 
I didn't want this film to be about me, and I didn't want it to be a first-person film about, oh, I'm learning about my father, you know. Um, but I felt that my very slow convincing of them and hopefully getting them to trust me was so interesting, and um, I wanted to sort of infuse some of that into the movie. You know, I wasn't interested in having power over these men at all, but their, the, the power that I felt they gave me was their trust in me. And Bob Caro, especially over the years that it took to make this film, I think came to trust that I was doing something worthwhile. In fact, I once apologized to him. I said, Bob, I'm so sorry this is taking so long. I think you thought it would take me six months. And seven years, and he said, first he's like, they can sign the last person you need to apologize for. <laughs> but, but he said, you know, and he, he did this thing that he does, you know, he closes his eyes and gets yeah. very internal, and then he looked up and he said, I think seven years is the number it takes to make something that will endure. Oh. Oh. It seemed like the most generous thing to sort of give me, or say to me, kind of freedom. So, there was him giving me the power to make First of all, thank you, and I hope you, your film gets seen by a lot of people, uh, because it needs to be seen for a couple of reasons. One is the individual accomplishment is now the king, but it's not an accident that we use the word rock star, because we're talking about individual accomplishments in the areas of music and athletics. We are not treated to examples of people doing exceptional things with words, Secondly, we're not treated to examples of people doing things through collaboration. Yeah. Intensive, loving, continuous collaboration. These are what's going to change the world. So your movie needs to be seen by an awful lot of people, not just people who are dedicated to literature and are people who have those books on their bookshelf, but maybe some people who have never really read very many books. Any chance of this coming to Netflix? So here's the story. Um, the movie was bought by Sony Pictures Classics, which is incredible, and it's being released. There's a rollout in 150 cities across the country, which is just overwhelming. Will anyone in Duluth go and see this film? I don't know. They're seeing it, so I've never heard of that city. But it's extraordinary. Um, in Late in the spring, I think in May, it will be on I don't, video on demand where you can pay to watch it, I think, on Amazon and mm -hmm. iTunes. And, that. and then, towards the end of the summer, it will be likely on that. I don't, I've asked Sony this many times, and I still don't understand it. Probably on Netflix, if not, then on one of the other streamers. We have time for one last question right here. Oh, thank you. Um, you mentioned being infused in the uh, relationship, and I wondered whether you got to ask questions um, like the relationship between men and their fathers in all cases. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that fascinating? It completely. Yeah. I had no idea. I knew my father had a very painful and difficult relationship with his father. But I didn't know that this theme of fathers mm -hmm. would emerge as such an important part of the film. It just kind of bubbled to the surface. I didn't know about Bob Caro's terrible relationship with his father. I didn't know that Bob Caro would talk about LBJ's terrible relationship with father. I didn't know my father would quote Lear every five minutes. <laughs> 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 you know, and there are moments when I thought, oh gosh, do you have a terrible father to be a successful yeah. person. <laughs> I really hope not, because I have such a good one. Um, but I find it, I find it very moving. These men who you feel are almost trying their whole lives to prove something, to prove their father's wrong about themselves. Um, and I think my father's, my own father's commitment to psychoanalysis and to changing himself is pretty extraordinary and allowed him to be such a 
incredible father to me. She was a mom. And to your brother, also. And to my brother, also. <laughs> we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.